thank you for coming. My name is Nizar Farsakh. I'm a Palestinian from a town in the West Bank called Birzeb, just seven minutes north of uh, Ramallah. I was born and raised in Dubai, uh, studied at the American University of Beirut, and then moved to Palestine in uh, 1999, because back then uh, my parents and I thought that the Palestinian state was right around the corner. So we said, okay, why, why go to Jordan when we can go to Palestine, right? And we built a house and we moved there. And a month later, uh, a year later, we had the Intifada. So it was very interesting for me. I uh, lived um, 10 years in Palestine, 99 till end of 2008. Uh, first work in an NGO where we, or research center, where we monitored Israeli settlement activities and their impact on the environment. And I used to give presentations to, um, you know, European uh, envoys, to Americans, to what have you. And uh, three years later, I did a master's in boundary studies in King's College London and got recruited to the Palestinian negotiating team from there. So from 2003 till 2008, I was the Palestinian technical advisor on all issues having to do with boundaries. And um, because Palestine is actually a very small place, I actually got to work with all the negotiators, so Dahlan, Sa'ib, uh, Dr. Sa'ib and uh, Rub, what have you, but also Salam Fayyad and uh, President Abbas. Uh, so I got a very intimate look at politics and how it's made and pol how policy is made. I was in the room when Fayyad and Rice were, you know, discussing issues. Um, I was in negotiation uh, sessions with Tsipi Livni and uh, uh, Abu Ala. So it was, for me, it was quite an eye-opening experience because I got to see the difference between how policy is actually made versus what gets reported in the media. And by far, I think this is the, the biggest, uh, you know, uh, capital I have when I impart, uh, when I do presentations or do trainings, is that I have a very good sense of uh, uh, you know, uh, what people don't get about policymaking. And that's precisely why I went into uh, advocacy and training on advocacy, because I understood much better uh, where civil society is barking up the wrong tree uh, with policymakers and where policymakers are blind to where civil society is really very useful and very uh, uh, important for the work that they want to do. So that synergy, that uh, bridging of perspectives is something I specialize in. To make a long story short, in uh, by 2007, I was really not only disillusioned with the peace process because I realized it was going nowhere, uh, but I also got really uh, disgusted by the internal fighting between Fatah and Hamas. That really shocked me. I was one of those who thought that that was a red line that we would never cross, and it was crossed quite violently. Um, so it came to a point where I realized I have nothing useful to contribute. I cannot think of something useful to contribute. Uh, so I left and I, thanks to a friend of mine who advised me to take this leadership course at the Harvard Kennedy School, um, I went to the Kennedy School and found my calling. I took these leadership courses. I fell in love with them. One was on organizing with Professor Marsha Kantz and the other was adaptive leadership with uh, Professor Ron Heifetz. I loved those courses so much that I stayed one more year to be a teaching assistant with them. Mm -hmm. To sink my teeth into how do you actually uh, effect change? How do you uh, motivate and mobilize people uh, to access their own resources of hope, right? Like how do you organically grow that lateral leadership and make change happen? Uh, as well as how do you have those difficult adaptive conversations of this, this environment around that has changed. Uh, we're going to need to adapt to this new environment what is essential in who we are and what we do and what is expendable? What, what is the stuff that we're going to need to get rid of in order to make space for the new, so that we adapt to the new situation, which is very difficult work. So for me, both those philosophies and leadership, uh, I felt, and this was back in 2010, uh, I felt this is something that we really need in the Arab uh, world. And lo and behold, we, have, uh, we had the revolutions in 2011, uh, so I got to work a lot with a lot of change agents across the Arab world. I, I don't want to go into too many uh, details, but I'm sharing this background of mine because I want you to understand where the museum came from, right? And I want you to see how you as young professionals have uh, career paths that you want to uh, plow 
uh, that might take in all sorts of different directions. But so long as you have a compass and you're true to your values and what is important to you, and and do you remember the story of the emperor's new clothes where you never lie to yourself and you you tell yourself what is really happening, right? Uh, you're gonna have an amazing and illustrious not only career but life. Um, so when I um, graduated, I, I came to DC, married my best friend from 18 years. She was living in DC. She's also Palestinian. Um, I did train on leadership and advocacy, but I also worked at the Palestinian delegation, which is like the Palestinian embassy here in DC from 2015 to 2011, sorry, to 2013. Uh, gave me a, a very good insight into DC and lobbying and how advocacy works in DC uh, and who's who. And uh, uh, then I did two years uh, stint with the project on Middle East democracy, POMED, uh, where I worked on training uh, Arab NGOs and think tanks, training them on advocacy. So 2013 till 2015, I got to work in Yemen, in Libya, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Morocco, trained some Iraqis in Tur Turkey. Uh, so I got a more circumspect uh, view of where the Arab world is and the, the, um, the promise, right? Like many people are very disillusioned where things are. I, I personally feel very optimistic, very hopeful because I've seen and have worked with some amazing people who are facing uh, phenomenal challenges, uh, but I, I see some latent potential that's out there. And I personally believe that the genie is out of the box, out of the bottle. And um, it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of synergies and collective action. Uh, but I believe that we're not going back. So that's in general who I am. Now, on the museum, the museum was actually started by the, uh, a young guy called Shara Nassar. He's a Palestinian from Bethlehem. And he comes from a very interesting family. His family, uh, his uncle, in fact, had a piece of land uh, east of Bethlehem uh, that Israeli authorities wanted to confiscate back in the uh, early 1990s. So what they did is they literally sat on the land. They just sat on it and they decided, like, we're not letting go of our land. This is our land. We need to protect it. But they also vowed uh, not to hate. They said, we, uh, will, uh, we shall not hate. And uh, we are going to use all sorts of nonviolence in order to protect our land. And in fact, until today, uh, their case is still in the Israeli courts. Uh, and they've managed to protect their land. And they've become a sort of icon for peace uh, and nonviolence uh, activists. Many people uh, come in coming into the Holy Land pass by what is called the Tent of Nations, uh, where they learn about uh, the Nassar family and what they do. Uh, so Bashara came from that um, ambiance. And when he came to the US in 2011, he came in a project on a project called the New Story Leadership Program, where they bring young Palestinians and young Israelis, put them in internships, kind of like uh, Ankyusar, uh, but for a full year, either in Congress or in NGOs in DC. And they learn how to tell their stories in ways that mobilize others and uh, to mm. be effective and authentic. It's a great program. So when he came, he was really impressed in how the museums in DC tell compelling stories, how you can't help but want to spend hours in them, right? Whether the Native American Museum or the Holocaust Museum or what have you, it's, it's a story, right? And it's, it's presented in such a way that's so compelling. But at the same time, he felt like, where's my story? Where's the Palestinian story? Um, so he felt this sense of absence. Uh, so the leader of the of the program, uh, Paul Costello, great guy, told him, why don't you start your own museum? So indeed he did. Uh, with a group of friends of his from Bethlehem, uh, one is a, a, an artist from the Haitian refugee camp, which is in Bethlehem. Another is a photographer from Bejala. Uh, they started what they called the Nakba Museum, which was a set of portraits and pictures of life in Palestine, specifically in Bethlehem, because the guys were from there, um, but like representing refugeehood, statelessness, uh, but also family, uh, uh, you know, ambition and things of the sort. And the tour, which was a traveling tour, uh, was so popular, uh, it, uh, in, in three and a half years or four years, it went to over 50 locations in the U.S., uh, universities, institutions, uh, what have you. And in 2017, in one of the um, uh, um, exhibits, the Manhattan College exhibit, 
uh, an American family was really taken by the exhibit. They, they thought it was amazing. And they said, you know, guys, this work is amazing. And they're like not Palestinian, they're like American American, right? <laughs> they're from from America, right? Um, they said, we have this space in DuPont, it's an office space, but you can have it two years free of rent. Uh, just do your museum there. So we were very excited and we thought, okay, great. <laughs> we had a three year plan for our traveling exhibit. Now we had to throw that, that, that plan and make a plan for an actual physical space uh, in DuPont. Um, so that's how we had the space in DuPont. How I got involved was in fact that I had a common friend between me and Shara. Her name is Fakhira. She's a Palestinian from a, a town ne next to Haifa, Palestinian citizen of Israel. And she told me, Nizar, there's this guy called Shara. He has an amazing project and you will love it. So indeed, I remember very well, I met him at Paul in uh, Metro Center. I don't know if you know it. And I remember very well how when he was telling me about the museum and what he wanted to do back then it was still a traveling exhibit i he showed me a poster and i recognized the poster was a painting of a famous picture of a, a grandmother and her granddaughter at the back of a truck uh being evacuated right and the little girl is looking at you with this defiant confident look so this artist turned this this picture into a painting and it was both amazing but also aesthetically beautiful right so when i saw that poster i said okay shara really knows what he's doing and i've been you know i've worked in diplomacy i've worked in advocacy i worked in negotiations uh, and of all the things that we could do i felt that this is it if we are to go going to change and overhaul the conversation around palestine in this country and in fact in the world we need to change the narrative about palestinians and we won't do that by hammering advocacy points. We're going to do that by having a human connection. People coming, experiencing something that makes them feel a certain way. And that's when they start to care because they are not going to move until they care. And no amount of data we throw at them is going to convince them if they don't care. Okay. So I got very excited and we, I started working with them. I, I became chair of the board and the whole like of course it's a startup none of us are museum experts we got a lot of help from the native american and african american museums we got help from experts in in the smithsonian in fact he's one of the our uh, board advisors amazing guy christopher um so we got a lot of in-kind support and that really helped us but that and that's my message to you guys that happened because we were passionate about something and we were clear about our values we knew that this museum is not about Palestinians are amazing people are, are better than everybody else. On the contrary, it's about us trying to tell our story because we feel everybody else has been telling our story instead of us. So we want to tell our stories our own way and get people to get to know us as human beings and connect with us and realize that our story is everybody else's story, that we have universal values and we are all in this together as human beings and to let the Palestinian story be a conduit to the universal story of how do we as human beings move forward uh, so that everybody has dignity, freedom and uh, respect. So that's that. And we did this while facing a lot of, you know, challenges with the community who wanted something more traditional, something that focused on how horrible Israel was. And we were saying, yes, there are a lot of horrible things that Israel are doing. But the story is not about Israel. The story is about us. There's more to us than just Israel, right? Um, and we want to be able to tell that bigger story and not get reduced to that story of either terrorists or victims. Uh, we want to tell a bigger story where people c connect to us, right, from all sorts of directions and then start to care. Um, so we were very careful to design the museum and curate it in a way that uh, it, I mean, it's a very small space, so we had to choose what is really important to put. Uh, we thought we needed to put those things that are quintessential for anybody to understand what is it like to be Palestinian? What are the things that are um, that show up for Palestinians in their daily lives? What are things that are important for Palestinians and important for non-Palestinians to understand about Palestinians? This is something we learned from the African-American Museum. They do an amazing job at 
showing you what they believe you need to see, right? Uh, so we did something similar where in that small space, we chose four or five themes that we thought deliver a message or, or uh, are vignettes into the lives of Palestinians and Palestine in ways that make people understand uh, kind of what is it like to be Palestinian, what is important to Palestinians, and what is Palestine to the world. So now I'm going to go into the, um, the museum. After COVID, we've had, now, we've started actually to, to make the virtual uh, exhibit uh, a while ago, but it, after COVID, we put it on the front uh, burner. Uh, and our, again, this um, GIS expert, again, just regular American, has nothing to do with Palestine, but he's a, a cartographer and a geographer and was really taken by the story of the museum. He did this GIS virtual tour of the museum, which is uh, amazing. Um, before I go into the presentation, I want to stop here and check if there are any questions or if I'm speaking too fast. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and quickly put them in the chat box. Um, but if you want to wait till the end, we'll just keep going. So um, yeah, get your questions in as uh, quick as you can. And are you able to follow? Yes, uh, yeah. Dr. Anthony here. I just wanted to um, acknowledge and commend you for your uh, approach here. We have tried to accentuate uh, in every session the need to have background, context, and perspective about issues, about challenges, about principles, about ideals, about policies, about positions, about actions, about attitudes. So you, you're right uh, in tune and in line with what we've been trying to do all summer long. And, uh, I, and yet you've done this without any conversation between the two of us or any exchange of emails uh, either. So uh, thank you and congratulations on your approach. It's superb. Great minds think alike. <laughs> But also, I, I genuinely think for the interns, because again, when I worked at the delegation, I realized the importance of this kind of sensitization of just understanding the levers of advocacy and how can you be effective? How do you communicate effectively? Uh, so the, these are the kinds of things that I think young folk need to be sensitized to so that they develop those skills and develop an ear to know what to listen to and how to critically uh, consume and digest news, but also presentations. Awesome. And uh, Benjamin had one question. So Benjamin, do you want to ask? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Um, I was curious, uh, just in your opinion, what the greatest challenge has been creating the museum and gathering artifacts, pieces for it, and uh, especially considering um, the geopolitical uh, situation and the occupation and so on, um, what your experience has been? So the, the greatest challenge is um, just amateurship, right? So we didn't know how to do it. We definitely knew what we wanted, but we didn't know how. None of us are museum experts. Uh, and that's my advice to you is, uh, you know, the Titanic was built by professionals and uh, uh, Noah's Ark was built by amateurs. <laughs> so not being experts did not stop us, uh, but being clear and committed to a, a mission and a story helped us attract the right people and uh, let go of people that didn't uh, agree with the mission. Like there were people in our board that disagreed with our vision uh, and they rightfully left because like you need the believers. In anything you do, you don't want everybody. You just need the believers. And by the way, this is some. This is advice I took from APAC. Um, I once went to this presentation by a guy who was recruited by APAC back, I think, in the mid '90s or late '90s, and probably uh, Anthony would know him, Mr. <laughs> Anthony, uh, because they hired him in order to increase their revenue, and he managed to triple um, APAC's uh, donations. And he said in his presentation that the base for uh, APAC's uh, uh, base, do donor uh, base is just 10,000 families. So imagine it's just 10,000 families that are uh, funding this huge operation. And he said, because you don't want everyone, you just want the believers because the believers are gonna give and give and give and you just need to keep the, the dream alive, right? So that's, that's what we learned Quickly in our process, we were trying to, you know, cajole and try to seduce 
key community uh, leaders in the Palestinian community and the Arab American community. But then we quickly realized that some either disagreed with the vision or others wanted control, which we were fine with. Like they can have part of the control if they shared our vision. Uh, but there were some who just did not believe in us, right? That they wanted control. They wanted us to follow their direction. And like we realized early on that if we believe in our uh, vision and mission, uh, we are the experts in it. Um, so it, that was a very difficult challenge because we let down some really big money. <laughs> Um, but we thought, you know what, and many people said, no, we need to, and we were part of that. We thought like we need to build this $40 million space, uh, that is worthy of Palestine. And then we realized, no, it's, it's not about the physical space. It's about the experience. How can you create a space that it gives the experience that you want visitors to get? And also we realized that, uh, for better or worse, this is a startup. We're going to need to fail early and fail often and learn the lessons. And we've done a lot of that. Many people came in and out of our teams and that is natural. And once we built a muscle for that, that helped. So th these were the main uh, challenges. It's just the amateurship that was going into it. But again, because we had a fire, because we have a vision that we believe in, um, we continued persevering. And in fact, it was the reactions we got and the results we got like the, the, uh, the family that donated the space in DC, right? That, that was really very humbling for us. That clearly we're doing something right. We received uh, $5,000 from somebody and uh, Fakhir and Shara and I were like, oh, that's great, we got $5,000 from uh, this guy. Uh, do you know him? It's like, no, I don't know him. Fakhir, no, I don't know. Like none of us knew him. And it turned out, we reached out to him and it turned out he said, oh, my neighbor is Palestinian and I love Palestinians. He's like, again, average American has nothing to do with Palestine, but just when he went online and saw that there was a museum of the Palestinian people, he just out of the blue donated $5,000, right? So, so that spoke to the brand of the museum, that we are clearly doing something right, that complete strangers are donating. In fact, we have a lot of Jewish uh, uh, donors. That's how effective our brand has been. And this is something we're very proud of, that uh, we have been uh, uh, effective. Awesome. And uh, we had another question, but I want to make sure we have time to see the full tour. So if you want to start with that, um, I think it's a great exhibit. So I want them to have, have time to see it. OK, so I'll go to the exhibit now. Perfect. And if the background noise uh, becomes too loud, please tell me. OK. Sounds good. OK. So um, the link I sent you, or I hope uh, Mike sent you, lands you on this page, which is the virtual uh, tour. This is basically a, um, a 360 uh, uh, um, video, or not, uh, uh, pictures of the actual space. You can see it's a very small space. So I'm going to virtually walk you through it to tell you what you would look and, and the thinking that went behind the different uh, sections. Basically, there are three main sections to the museum. Uh, and the way it came about, and just to give you perspective, it took us a full year to come up with, <laughs> with the creation. Um, we asked everybody and their cousin and we kept brainstorming and adding stuff and deleting stuff. So this came out of, like, that was a real labor um that uh, came out of it and the struggle we had was definitely okay we have a small space but also um knowing we had a big range of audience right we had the palestinians who wanted to celebrate their uh, heritage right so these are audiences and we have um people who know about palestine and, and are interested to learn more and we have people who, have, who know nothing and don't know what the word palestine means uh, who are just curious, right? So that bra broad range of audiences made us really, that was a struggle in the creation. Uh, the other was that we wanted to focus on art and uh, whether visual art or uh, audio art or artistic, what have you, in order to uh, um, have people connect in all sorts of different ways because uh, art uh, is a universal language in general. So we wanted that as the input. 
Um, but we quickly realized when we did different exhibits when we were traveling exhibit that often like if, if a, a Palestinian um, painting had the key, somebody who didn't know about Palestine wouldn't understand the symbolism of the key, right? So we understood that before we go to the gallery uh, of art section, we needed a contextual section, a section where visitors um, experience key aspects of Palestine and Palestinians and their lives uh, so that when they come to the uh, artistic part, uh, they can actually appreciate it uh, much better. Uh, and one of the uh, things that we wanted to start with, and that's why I'm, I'm starting here in the first section. So I said there were three sections. One is the, the historical context. Uh, the other is the current context. And the third is the uh, the uh, temporary uh, art exhibit. Every four or five months, we change that. But the two other, uh, the first two galleries are permanent because these are contextual ones. Uh, so one of the things we wanted to start with is correcting um, a misconception that uh, we often face when we are Palestinians, that there's a conception that either we are, we are not a people, uh, that we are an old people that are no longer there, or that we are an invented people, right? Um, so we wanted to start by showing both the old and the new. So when you come in, this is of course the door of the museum. Um, oops. What you see here, uh, um, right on the corner here, you have a, 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 a modern painting. And in the glass boxes here, you have a Nabataean vase that's around 3,000 years old. So the point here is that the Palestinians are a very ancient people and they are busy in the current world as well. They, they produce modern art. So we wanted to juxtapose those two things uh, next to each other. Here are uh, like, this is um, uh, pottery and this is glasswork from Hebron. Uh, we used to have um, uh, another piece of modern art by Samia Halabi. Uh, she's a very famous modern art artist in New York. She's Palestinian. Uh, but then we, we put this map that we did of um, where are the Palestinians today, right? Which is the distribution of Palestinians across the, the world. And you can see that in one of the tabs here, maps, where are Palestinians today? Uh, on this page, uh, we have five tabs. So the tour of the museum, which we are at, tour of MVP, the permanent collection, Art of Palestinian Women, which is the current temporary exhibit we have, making their mark, I'm going to explain it later, and then this map. So you're welcome to browse it. Um, but we put it there because also we wanted to give context that Palestinians are uh, in Palestine, but also a dispersed people. In fact, half of our population is dispersed uh, outside of Palestine. And um, then we move on to... Um, this map, which is, a, of course, you can click it. It's a National Geographic map of the Holy Land. Um, I'm, you can, of course, at your own pace, uh, go uh, look at it. But the point of this map is that it's a 1938 map. And it's called, uh, the, it's titled Bible Lands. And the point of putting it there is one is that uh, in that map, they, uh, Palestine is called Palestine, right? So show 1938 this space was called Palestine. It's not true that there was no such thing as Palestine. Uh, but for us, more importantly, when you look specifically um, at different areas that are uh, distinguished in the map, you realize quickly that the producer of the map had an, a specific agenda. This map was produced for American consumers who are interested in the Holy Land and might be uh, visiting the Holy Land. Uh, so they have something like, this is where Shamshon met Delilah, right? So it's um, when you see these things, you realize that the maps that were being produced of Palestine were produced by non-Palestinians for non-Palestinian purposes. And likewise, this National Geographic, uh, original actually donated by the National Geographic Inst uh, um, Society, uh, um, uh, uh, we have it physically, but also down there, uh, we have it on an iPad digitally, and you can also browse it digitally when you click on this um, icon. Uh, you can go through the pages and see the Orientalism, right, that's in 
the uh, um, in the writing, but more or and more importantly, how the writer was taking pictures that fit his a priori image of the Holy Land. Like he had a conception of what the Holy Land is supposed to look like. And when he didn't find that, he choreographed pictures that fit what he wanted to say, right? So again, other another example of how the Palestinian story is being told by others for their own purposes. And a big challenge for us as Palestinians is to be able to tell our stories our own way and not to fit into other people's, not get fit molded into other people's uh, agendas. Uh, you can click on all of the, these things. One thing I wanted to say is uh, we are reopening on July 25th. So to the extent that you guys are here, uh, we are doing limited uh, visits, I believe five people at a time. Uh, so do uh, um, connect with us uh, if you're interested in visiting physically because it's different when you actually see this stuff. Like here we have an actual passport from the uh, uh, British era when the, uh, Br uh, the Brits uh, controlled Palestine. And it's a British passport, Palestine, right? By uh, uh, it was by the, um, somebody from the Sa family, uh, and there was another one by the Tarazi family. Uh, generously donated, like when we got the one from Ghassan Tarazi, it was his father's passport, and he had it wrapped in aluminum foil. He was so it took us a full year to convince him to uh, uh, borrow it from him. Uh, so we are very humbled by what people donated to us, uh, because again, it. it you can't understand Palestinians if you don't understand why we get obsessive about our passports, right? Uh, the other thing in the same section we show here, there are three documents. The first one is a marriage certificate of Hanna Sa and Nabiha Sa. And here you have the certificate of uh, Suad, their daughter, being born, and then uh, the marriage certificate of Suad. Why do we put that? Why did we put these three? Because we wanted to show people that one of the things that you're going to realize when you go there and, and look at them is that the marriage certificate was produced 1965, but in fact, the marriage was 1938. And that's because they got married in 1938. They had to leave their uh, homes because of the war in 1948 and didn't have the documents. So they had to re-register their marriage in 1965, right? Likewise, Saad was born in 19... Uh, I can't remember now the date, uh, an earlier date, but her birth certificate was produced later on in Jordan, and her name was written differently. And then when she got married to um, a Palestinian American, uh, uh, John George Peter, which was actually Butros, right, who was a Christian Palestinian living in Detroit and had his name Americanized, right, uh, her name also got butchered. So it was hard for her to prove that she was the same person because our names get, uh, you know, transliterated differently in different jurisdictions, whether it is Palestine, Jordan, uh, uh, or America, right? Uh, so these are the kinds of challenges that Palestinians face that other people don't face, right? So you ask, uh, uh, you know, uh, an average American, you know, um, about their birth certificate or their marriage certificate, for them, it's not an issue. For Palestinians, it's a big deal. Like we hold on to these things as if our lives depend on it because often our lives actually do depend on them. Um, very quickly here on, on those two panels that is in this, um, on the sides of where the, the map of where Palestinians are and where the uh, Nakba section starts, on the two sides, we have pictures of life before 1948 uh, the Ramallah society, merchants, what have you, just to show what life was like before 1948. And in this panel, the, the Nakba panel, uh, we uh, show pictures of uh, Zionism, of uh, the British mandate and how uh, the British were, um, uh, the Palestinians were protesting uh, uh, both the British mandate and the, the Zionist project. Uh, but for Palestinians, the connection was we saw the British as the, a bigger problem because they were enabling the Zionist project. And that's why uh, we were fighting the British. So here you see protests and the, the British army quelling the protests. Uh, the bottom picture is of uh, one of the Zionist settlements before 1948. Um, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time, so I'm, I'm just going to go quickly through it and showing different aspects. So the partition plan and what happened with it, the, uh, the different 
uh, places where Palestinians ended up going, right? So that the bottom map with all the arrows shows both the urban and rural populations that uh, fled Palestine from different provinces in Palestine to make the point that uh, 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 urban and rural people from Haifa left from their villages and from their towns and ended up in the same refugee camp, right? So what happened to the Palestinian society in 1948 was literally the shattering and fragmentation of the social fabric. The mayor was now just a refugee in a refugee camp, and he was in the same refugee camp with uh, villagers who are from villages that were 100, 200 uh, uh, miles away from him. So the, the whole Palestinian society was completely shattered in 1948, and it's uh, a testament to the resilience of the Palestinian identity that we managed to patch it all back uh, up again with these new identities. So the next gallery, gallery two, where we're going to go, uh, speaks to that, where um, it's this section, when you start from this side, uh, you see what, what has been the reaction of Palestinians to their Nakba, right? So um, we created these uh, student groups, we created these arts groups when there was this poster, the blue poster or the uh, uh, turquoise poster is for uh, Women's uh, Day, International Women's Day, because we felt uh, uh, the women's struggle is part of our struggle as well. So we were mainstreaming the revolution. Uh, the other poster is of uh, the young generation joining the fight. It was created by the General Union of uh, Palestinian Students, GUPS. Um, so all of that, and of course, Hamdala. Some of you know him. Again, this is a, a character uh, uh, um, uh, drawn by a famous characterist, uh, Najil Ali, who was assassinated. He was very um, uh, poignant in his uh, critic, uh, political critique, not only of uh, Israel and the United States uh, uh, dispossessing the Palestinians, but also of Arab uh, uh, regimes who were uh, not supporting Palestine enough and the internal contradictions within Palestine as well. Uh, so these were example, or these are examples that we show of how Palestinians, um, you know, dealt with the Nakba and of course the key, the importance of the key, and how the older generation uh, uh, sends forward the the key to the next generation. And then the next panel is about the occupation and the checkpoints. Uh, we have also, here you don't see it, but there's an iPad where you can click and listen to stories of how people are been dealing with the occupation. And the opposite panel is about culture, how we realize that, you know, embroidery or painting and all sorts of our, um, uh, cultural artifacts are actually quite central to our cause, that we need to protect those and uh, celebrate our heritage, but also uh, renew it. So the, the traditional embroidery that was used for dresses is now being used for bookmarks or wallets, right? So the repurposing for new uses. And here the, the, the panels of the pictures of the uh, dresses is sh shows the, the from where that dress came from, right? So different visitors, when they come, they recognize, oh, this is my grandmother's uh, um, dress and she was from Haifa or she was from Ramallah and so on and so forth. And the, la the other, the last part of the, um, of the panel is about different forms of resilience, how with all the difficulties, like we show a picture of how in Gaza, there was this uh, music conservatory that was uh, destroyed by an Israeli uh, attack in um, in one of the Gaza wars. After the, the conservatory was de demolished, um, the, the artists, uh, made a concert on top of the rubble, right? Like we refuse to die. Uh, likewise, we have pictures of other, uh, other examples, including uh, there's an iPad there where you listen to the story of Ah Tamimi and uh, the Nassar family, as well as a village called, um, um, I can't remember, uh, not Aqraba, uh, I, can't, I forgot the name, but anyways, that was demolished 130 times. Every time the Israeli authorities demolish it, they rebuilt it. So again, examples of Palestinian resilience. And then we go to the last section of the permanent exhibit which is the part that we call making their mark. This is the artistic side. When you come out of the gallery too, you come to this, um, making their mark. Different Palestinians, uh, where they are today. Uh, and basically you, you open the, um, the, the flap and you read about the person, Mason Zayed, Simon Shaheen, Edward Said, uh, uh, Rashida Tlaib, Bella, 
and Gigi Hadid, uh, um, DJ Khaled. So the funny thing here, of course, we want to show the breadth of where Palestinians are at because we want to say uh, from all of this difficulty, from all of these challenges, look where Palestinians are now. It's a story of hope, a story of resilience, a story of the power of the human spirit that we refuse to die. And look at us, look at us doing some amazing stuff all over the, the, the map. Uh, but also you have when you have a family of Palestinians coming, the older generation say, oh, wow, Edward Said, right? And the younger, the, the sons and daughters say, Edward who? Uh, and then the young, uh, the young ones see, oh, DJ Khaled, and their parents go, DJ who? <laughs> right? Again, to make the point of how uh, we are spread out and we have amazing Palestinians who have done amazing things. Um, so it's just, we wanted to end with a story of hope that from all of this difficulty, from all of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 all of these challenges, uh, the Palestinians continue to be resilient, continue to make their mark. Uh, so it's a story of hope for all peoples who are feeling uh, uh, beaten or uh, uh, downtrodden. And the final gallery is, of course, the uh, temporary gallery. This time it's uh, women's art. You can come and see it and see different types of art. Before that, we had uh, a different exhibit. And every four to five months, we, we change that exhibit. So, And then when you go out here to your right, uh, we have some stuff that you can buy. So you're welcome to buy some, you know, again, the embroidered wallets and some kafirs and some really beautiful, some of, the, some of it is actually, um, as you see on the top, are prints of some of the art. And these sell like uh, hotcakes. So this is in general the museum. Now, I, what I wanted to also show is that there is um, a comment section. It's hard to see here, but uh, right here to the, uh, to the right of the, or left of the window, right of this picture, you can see there are white panels on the side of the wall where people put their comments. And we had three questions. Uh, what surprised you? Um, uh, what's the first thing? Yeah, some other question I forgot. That. But the third one, how do you see yourself part of this story? Because we do not want our visitors to leave uh, thinking that this is the end of the, uh, the exhibit. We want them, we want this to be a start of the conversation, not the end of it. Uh, the whole point of the museum is to make people come in and then come out with more questions, being interested in trying Palestinian food and going to Palestine and meeting Palestinians. The whole point of the museum is to recruit and bring in more people into this conversation, as well as the intersectional conversation. How do we talk about uh, the Palestinian issue and the African-American issue and the Native American issue and the women's issue? Like there is an amazing Palestinian artist and activist, um, Yasmin Mjelli, who did amazing work. I don't know if you, if you know of her, uh, Baby Fist, uh, where she engages uh, sexual harassment in Palestine in some amazing ways, right? Art, but also like people writing their stories of sexual harassment. So for us, it's an, a, a, um, an example of how uh, Palestinians are part of this uh, uh, conversation around sexual harassment, that this is how sexual harassment happens in Palestine, and this is what Palestinians are doing about it, right? So it's about entering this general conversation. This is how the museum ends. Um, I do strongly advise you to try to make it to the museum after July 25th. Um, we're happy to arrange a physical visit, uh, not least because our visits, again, are about the in human interaction. Uh, there are docents that show you the exhibit, and each docent tells their own story. The same way that I told you my story, they say their own story. We have Palestinians, and we have non-Palestinians who love Palestine and care about Palestine, so they tell their story of why they care about this. Again, because we want to have that human connection. We want this, you know, we had this African-American uh, advisor who helped us in uh, uh, management uh, um, consulting. And when he saw the pictures of the occupation and the, uh, and the situation in, in the occupation in the West Bank, he said, oh my God, this reminds me of Detroit. I'm from Detroit, right? Like he connected at that level. Um, so different people connect at different places. And we, it really is about that human interaction. I'll stop at this and open it up for Q&A. Don't mind my cat. Awesome. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, and also, I wanted to add um, for the interns, you should follow the museum on Twitter. Um, they always have really great events and classes going on. Um, I follow them. I think it's amazing. You guys should as well. It's at MPPDC. 
Um, and it's just a great page to follow, so make sure you do that. Um, and Andrew, it looks like you're first up. Actually, uh, Emma, you had a question. Emma, do you want to start off asking questions? Yes, sure. Can you hear me all right? I can, yes. OK, first of all, I'd like to thank you so much. This is so wonderful to hear everything. Um, I was just wondering, what is your personal favorite item in the museum and why? <laughs> Uh, it's no longer there. Our previous exhibit had a beautiful piece of work from a, a Gazan uh, artist, which was a map of the world made of pages of Palestinian passports uh, with, uh, you know, airport stamps and visa stamps and canceled stamps, right? So it's the map of the world, North America, South America, Asia, Europe, Africa, and Australia, right? But from those pages, and for me, it really spoke to me. It's like, for us Palestinians, like, like this is how we look at the world. Is this a place where I can go without a visa? Is this a place that I can even go there, right? Um, it just really spoke to me. Uh, but if of the things that are there from the permanent exhibit, uh, I would think the, um, the National Geographic map, that for me is like speaks volumes. Thank you. Sure. Awesome. And Andrew, you're next up on the chat. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I am glad that there is a museum for, Pal of Pal uh, for Palestinians in DC. I was thinking about it, and I'm sure it faced a lot of opposition in its opening and its development. Um, more recently, what opposition have you seen um, uh, since the museum's opening? So interestingly enough, we expected far more opposition, and we didn't get it. So we're very pleasantly surprised. Uh, we expected opposition from, of course, the pro-Israel and, and Zionist groups. We got very little. Um, I'm, um, after this, I'm going to share some resources. So we did this interview on the Kojo Namdi show last year. And somebody asked a stupid question, and we answered them. Right? No. Uh, so we got, got some of that, but not a lot, to be quite honest. Uh, and the other opposition is from more traditional Palestinians who wanted more, uh, you know, blood and gore and, uh, you know, cap decapitated heads and what Israel does and how horrible it was. Um, and so, and that continues to be some of the opposition. Some people want more of that and they feel like we are soft Zionism. We, dis we I mean, we uh, respectively, uh, res respectfully disagree with them. But what I can say is that we, we are playing a leadership role in our community. Many of those people are starting to see the value in the way we're doing things and how we're doing it differently, uh, and um, how we genuinely see ourselves as just doing that. And there are plenty of other institutions that do amazing work on advocacy, on research. So there is the Institute for Palestine Studies. There, there is the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights. They do amazing work. We do not need to do the work that they're doing because they're already doing and it's very good. We do this part, which is the human connection, the story part. And we want to continue to do that because we think that's where we uh, do our dual purpose of making it a hub where Palestinians can be proud and exhibit and celebrate their identity in all sorts of different ways. Food, like we had a, 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 a um, cook uh, um, exhibit, uh, Leila um, Haddad, uh, cook, cook lesson, uh, cooking lesson, uh, but also uh, how to engage people who know nothing about Palestine uh, to make them care about Palestine, right? So uh, we, uh, one of the people who wasn't very happy with our museum, she's a person who worked on the Arafat Museum in Ramallah, which is, by the way, amazing. They did an excellent job there. And she was a bit, no, you, you're g making it too soft uh, on, uh, on, on Israel. You need to put more facts so that people know what really happened and how Israel is horrible. And I told her, listen, before people um, are willing to listen to those facts and to correct their misconceptions, they need to care. And they're not going to care until they see, uh, until they feel something that connects them to Palestine. This museum is about making people care so that they then go and read more about Palestine and get the facts and get interested to learn the facts. Because before they care, they're not going to look at those facts. All right, fantastic. And Kobe, I think you had a question if you want to ask it. Sure. 
Uh, I wanted to ask if you could speak about the symbolism of the key and the kafeya and Palestinian identity. Sure. Um, I strongly recommend that you come to the museum uh, because there are different places where we talk about it. But basically, it's about how for us Palestinians, we feel like the, the, the key symbolizes the great injustice. Like we actually have the key to the goddamn house. How can you tell us this is not our land, right? Um, but also that while we're still holding the key, um, the Nakba is not just 1948. It's a continuous catastrophe where Palestinians are continu continually dispossessed. There's continuous land confiscation. Um, uh, Palestinians get kicked out in Syria, in Iraq, in Kuwait, in Libya, right? Um, so that statelessness, um, that situation of, of difficulty started in 1948, but didn't end there. And the, and the key is kind of that um, key that we hold in our necks, like the albatross, let's say, uh, that is so present to us whenever we're interacting with the world, that we're constantly um, discriminated against, uh, uh, face more difficulties because we are stateless, because we've been dispossessed. Right, so that's the symbolism of the uh, of the key, and of course the kafia is just, you know, the the uh, um, traditional head uh, 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 dress of the um, of males in, in in Palestine that we again repurposed when we had uh, resistance fighters who used to use it to cover their faces, but then also we use it in our dances and so on. So again, it's the repurposing of that symbol that's quintessentially uh, for, of course, it's across the Levant. Uh, but but you see it much more in, in, in Palestine, especially the black one, the black and white one. Excellent. And we have time for, it looks like, one more question. So, Benjamin, I think you'll round us out for the end of the talk. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, so, how do you think uh, Banksy's museum in Bethlehem compares to the Museum of Palestinian People? Uh, it's lovely. It's actually, we collaborated with him. He donated some of his artwork in an auction that we did. Um, I think it's a similar initiative along the same lines. Now, I know it's very expensive. The hotel is very expensive, but I mean, that's the idea. But the idea of how do you bring something that's contemporary uh, and make it funny, you know, but at the same time, make a political statement, right? So it's about grabbing people's attention and with that, providing something that is of value, right? Something that makes you um, really be present to what's the situation, but also think, what can I do about it? Uh, so yeah, it's uh, along similar lines. And uh, one other thing I wanted to say is that when we created the museum, one of our uh, uh, basic values that we all agreed on as, as founders was that we do want to co-author. We want to collaborate with other organizations. We definitely do not think we are an authority. Uh, we are interested in the intersectional conversation. We are interested in collaborating with other uh, organizations like Mosaic Theater, uh, Hopkins, what have you, the Institute for Palestine Studies, uh, because we want to collaborate and want to do things together. We were, we're collaborating with the museum in Birzeit, the Palestinian Museum in Birzeit. Uh, we've helped the Palestine House in San Diego. There is, of course, the museum in Connecticut, excuse me, and now there's um, the, new, uh, the Palestinian community in New Jersey. We're helping them start a, a museum there too. So we, we are very big on collaboration. Awesome. All right. And unfortunately, we're out of time, um, but that was fantastic. I loved it. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and yeah, thank you. it was great to hear from you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And I'm always happy to do this. And I'm going to send Michael a few other resources if people are interested. And feel free to connect with me or anybody at the museum. Follow us, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, um, Twitter. Uh, and please spread the word. We, we keep getting people telling us that they never heard that there was a museum. So please spread the word. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Um, have a great Thank rest you. of your day. And um, yeah, that was amazing. Thank you. Bye.